sort of task. This meeting is being recorded. Um, this is an extremely easily stated task. The partition function is sort of the primary actor in your first quarter of stat mech. The hydrogen atom is the primary actor in your second quarter of quantum mechanics. Um, but if you calculate the partition function, you'll find a nasty surprise. And I think I'm going to leave it as an exercise to the reader to just sort of figure out what's going on here and how uh, physics seems to be breaking down. And the answer has a lot to do with the Rydberg states that Manuel is going to tell us about. Um, so the characteristics of these Rydberg states are um, very different from the characteristics of a ground state atom. While they're still neutral atoms, they're not um, they're not ions. They uh, they really look different than um, our atom in the ground state. They're physically very large. That actually has to do with the resolution of the uh, paradox that I referred to on the last slide. Uh, as a consequence of that large volume, they're very polarizable. They interact strongly with applied uh, electric fields. <clears throat> um, and they have, uh, uh, relatedly, very strong and very long range interactions. Um, and this gives rise, to, gives rise to blockade physics, which is going to be a key uh, element of the, um, the story that Manuel is going to tell us. They also have a finite radiative lifetime. This is um, dependent on the particular state they're in. And there are uh, states called circular Rydberg states, which have um, the maximal angular momentum allowed for the relevant principal quantum number where this, um, uh, this lifetime can actually be significantly extended. Um, and I've put down here uh, just a, a list of how uh, a couple of these different properties that I wrote down here tend to scale with the principal quantum number. So you can see the radius is getting very large as n gets high. And formally, n can go to infinity. And you know, in practice, n can get into the, you know, getting up towards 100. So, so the radius can be very large. And this is, on the, in the right-hand column, just some particular Rydberg atom, an excited state of cesium uh, with, uh, with real values for these quantities. Uh, of course, the levels get closer and closer together, as you see in the cartoon I showed on the first slide. Um, uh, the polarizability gets gets extremely high, and the uh, the lifetime also depends on the principal quantum number. And so that's I think one of the um, one of the ingredients that goes into choosing which Rydberg state you want to work with. Okay, that's pretty much what I wanted to say, just in terms of situating Rydberg atoms within the context of atomic physics. Um, I want to now um, quickly switch to the second of the two actors I'm talking about, which is alkaline earth atoms, which is also going to be a key actor in Manuel's talk. Um, this periodic table here has X'd out the atoms that have been Bose condensed uh, or brought to degeneracy. And in some sense, that's a proxy for the neutral atoms over which we have really good quantum control. Uh, the list for ions is, is quite different. Um, and, uh, and you heard from Dan uh, recently about some, you know, some bullseyes on a few atoms that aren't yet X'd out here. Uh, Dan is, is well on his way to telling us about a technetium BEC uh, at next year's CIQC update. Um, and so the, the very, you know, for non-atomic physicists, the traditional stomping grounds for neutral atom physics is over here on the left. <clears throat> you can see that all the non-radioactive alkalis have been both condensed. Um, and these are the atoms that are the easiest to control with lasers in a sense because um, their electronic structure is like the electronic structure of hydrogen, nice and simple lots of cycling transitions and accessible to our laser technology, mostly, although hydrogen is pretty challenging. Um, however, uh, and this is again sort of treading on territory that Dan already talked about really nicely uh, in a recent colloquium, a lot of new capabilities uh, in atomic physics and potentially quantum information relevant capabilities come from moving beyond this group group one region. Um, and, uh, uh, and Manuel is, uh, is in this territory because um, the atom that he's going to be telling us about today is actually strontium, which is uh, a group two element. Um, and this, uh, these uh, atoms are often described as helium-like uh, because, uh, because they have two valence electrons. So the relevant electronic structure is a little bit like the electronic structure of helium, um, which is famously uh, separated into these two parts uh, where the electrons are in a singlet and in a triplet configuration. And you see that here from this energy level diagram of strontium, all the states to the left of this central line um, with these dashed lines going across it are in a singlet state, including the ground state. Um, and on the right, uh, the, uh, the states are triplets. And so the sort of one of the 
relevant features of strontium and other alkaline earth atoms is you have from the ground state two relevant classes of low-lying transitions. One strong alkali-like transition, which um, uh, is singlet to singlet and thus um, fine by the rules of atomic physics. So this is uh, in the blue for strontium. And then one more forbidden transition, which is a single to triple transition. And this is the transition that's famously used to um, do a lot of beautiful uh, clock physics with neutral strontium. And, and that's also gonna be an element of what Manuel is gonna tell us about. And the reason that these lines are good for clocks is that they're very narrow. And the reason they're very narrow is that they're um, effectively forbidden by a number of selection rules in atomic physics. Um, I think uh, without getting into detail of the rest of this diagram, you can sort of see that the general feature here, which, which, um, which is a feature of non-hydrogenic atoms in general, is you have a, a rather rich electronic structure and you can hope to um, play some tricks that would be hard to play with uh, an atom like rubidium, for example. Okay, so that is, I think, pretty much what I wanted to say about um, the, the two uh, you know, Rydberg atoms and alkaline earth atoms. And so the third important uh, system to introduce is Manuel himself. Um, uh, Manuel did his PhD in Munich um, with a group of Emmanuel Bloch. Uh, and then it, it was a postdoc at the Max Planck, I think, with Ignacio Sirac before becoming a postdoc at Harvard, uh, where he really pioneered some of the um, techniques that we're going to hear about today. He's been uh, an assistant professor at Caltech for the last four or five years and um, has received many awards, including the NSF Career Award and the Young Investigator Prize from the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Um, Manuel, we're super excited for your talk. So welcome. And uh, I will stop sharing and turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. And thanks for inviting me to the colloquium. Let me see if I can get everything right here. Share. All right, I hope you all see the slides. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so I'm Manuel Entras from Caltech, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about a story um, concerning how we control uh, neutral atoms uh, using a technique uh, called tweezer arrays and, and in combination with Rydberg atoms, what David just uh, told you about, and, and how we use this for certain applications in quantum science. Let me start very broadly by just talking about experimental systems in quantum science, and there's a very broad range um, from traditional solid state materials to solid state qubits that we have all heard about. So for example, superconducting qubits and there's cold atomic systems and then what I would call photonic and phononic systems. And our work is situated in, in, in this cold atomic system bracket. And, and I think what is really interesting about the field to me is that despite the kind of really um, broad variety of approaches, there's in a sense a common set of goals and applications that, that many of us are interested in. Uh, one of the central ones and also very central to our center is, is quantum computing. So I would like to build computers that could outperform uh, classical computers, but making use of quantum mechanical properties one way or another. Uh, a topic that I have been interested in a lot in, in over my career is what I would call quantum simulation. That is really to study quantum many body physics in, in an extremely controlled setting and, and to learn something new about their complex behavior. Um, and then AMO physics uh, traditionally has a very strong footing in what I would call precision measurement because you can just, uh, control systems extremely well. And, and I think there's a new frontier there also where we uh, now uh, really use more and more quantum control. In, in, in particular, we're also interested in um, can entanglement, for example, help you with quantum measurements beyond what you could classically do. And eventually, we're all interested in maybe uh, connecting these systems. Uh, maybe we have distributed networks of quantum computers or distributed networks of sensors, and this falls into the bracket of called quantum networks. So this is, so broadly speaking, the goals. And then and in simplified terms, uh, one could say, like the goal for all of these is to outperform in a way their classical counterparts. So say I want to build a computer that's better than a classical computer. And um, again, in very, very simplified terms, a key ingredient for achieving this, I would say, is large scale entanglement. And, and uh, these goals are nice and our approaches are nice, but this is extremely challenging in practice. And let me kind of sketch this maybe for, for um, students or so that haven't thought about it that much in a, again, very simplified term. And I call this the entanglement challenge in a way. So you start, uh, say, with an array of qubits one way or another, and say they're all in the ground state. And then you progressively try to build up entanglement by applying, say, two qubit gates or like an interaction in one way or another. And then, say, you form, for example, with this central two qubits, a, a 
a two qubit entangled state and you can try to grow it more and more and then until you have a very, very complicated superposition. But if you really think about this a little bit more carefully, if you want to um, generate a very, very complex superposition, you have to grow this kind of in a linear fashion. So you see that here. So um, there's a certain time scale that you need uh, to build up entanglement in a system if you have short range interactions. And short range interactions, except for cavity systems, maybe is really uh, how most of these systems work. So there's, um, um, then if you think about it more, uh, it's extremely challenging to actually do that for two reasons. So first, it takes you longer uh, to build up entanglement in larger systems. So typically the time scale you would need to entangle a system grows linearly with the linear extent of the system. That's one thing. But also the larger your system, it gets the more um, probability for an error you kind of accumulate. So each of these systems could, uh, each of these atoms could uh, have a spontaneous decay, for example, and introduce an error. And then if I really want to build up a large scale entangled a state without an error, then my probability for, for having no error basically scales some sort of exponential in the in the system size. So this is really some sort of the first like fundamental challenge of this of this area is really some sort of um, the scaling of entanglement growth and, and decoherence with system size. I would say this is a fundamental challenge that I think all of us uh, in a way have to have to deal with. At the same time, there's of course a, a technological challenge, which is as I try to grow systems and, and, and grow large scale entangled states. Um, it's just principally um, hard to scale and control at the same time at, at the single particle level. So I can take, for example, Bose-Einstein condensates. They have been there for many, many years. They have 20 million particles, but I cannot control each of the particles individually easily. At the same time, there are single ion experiments. We have maybe certain ions, but it's not easy to make them large into hundreds or maybe thousands of atoms. So there's a competition in a way between how, how large I can scale and, and uh, and, and at the same time, can I control the system? And the talk is in very rough terms, again, this is how we you know, try to address these challenges uh, with individually controlled neutral atoms and novel techniques for individually controlled neutral novel atoms. Now, um, the outline is, is roughly like that. So I'll first introduce uh, our kind of um, workhorse, which are tweezer arrays to trap atoms and control atoms. I then talk a little bit about Rydberg interactions and some of the basic physics and not the basic things that have been seen uh, using, using Rydberg interactions. And I, I'll switch to our work at Caltech and, and on alkaline earth atoms and, and tweezer arrays and how we control them, how we cool them, how we image them, uh, show some results for high, high fidelity entanglement. And then um, I'll have a section on what I call many body benchmarking and randomness. This is some of our most recent results. So we have some new results on how we actually benchmark many body dynamics on these systems in terms of estimating many body fidelities. And then uh, at the very end, if I still have some time, I will show it two slides or three slides uh, like on, on, on ideas going towards quantum metrology. Okay, um, before I jump in there, uh, let me acknowledge uh, the group at Caltech, um, students and postdocs who, do, who did all the work, some of them left already and have their own groups now. Uh, we have theory collaborators on, on some of the ideas and I'll show in particular some um, slides uh, on, on results that have been achieved together with Sun Wong Choi, who's at Berkeley still maybe, I think is about to move to P MIT soon. And some of the clock results that we have have been actually uh, carried out in collaboration with the Chat Propulsion Lab in, in Pasadena. Okay. Um, before I start out, let me ask, are there questions already on that first section? It's a relatively um, broad overview. I, I, I'll stop now and then every few slides, so just like wait for questions. And people should also feel free to put questions in the chat and we can sort of aggregate them for such stops. Yeah, or just speak up, it's okay. We can have a conversation, don't worry. Okay, all right, good. So, um, all right, if not, let me, just, let me just jump in and talk about optical tweezers sort of the you know uh, workhorses of, of how we, how we um, uh, use these arrays. So what's an optical tweezer? Just very simple. An optical tweezer is an extremely tightly focused laser beam um, that you generate with a high resolution objective. And typically you focus down to about a micrometer size. And then um, with this very tightly focused laser beam, you can essentially try to pick up atoms from a pre-cooled atomic cloud. And so if you stick this tweezer into a cloud of atoms, um, and then you release the cloud of atoms, you will typically trap one or zero atoms in that visa. And this has been shown um, for the first time around 2000 in, in the group of uh, Philip Ramsey in this very seminal paper. And in particular, what they observed is that if you do that, you stick that visa into a cloud of atoms and let the cloud disperse and then you image, what you see is often just zero or one atom. And the reason for this is that if you have two atoms into, in the visa, there's a so-called uh, light assisted collision process uh, 
uh, where uh, uh, two atoms basically collide with a photon in a, in a very uh, high energy collision in a way that basically removes double double occupation in the in 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 tweezer. So you have to imagine you stick the tweezer into the cloud and you look at it and you typically have zero or one atom. So that's the kind of um, standard process uh, how this moves forward. Now um, in our in our experiments, now we generate a large scale arrays of tweezers and there's basically two fundamental techniques to do that. One is so-called spatial light modulators. Um, this is nicely described, for example, in this uh, paper by Anton Braves, or uh, acousto-optical deflectors. Here I will just explain acousto-optical deflectors. So acousto-optical deflectors um, are relatively uh, simple devices. So you shine in a laser beam and then you have a, a crystal, and in that crystal you have a, a moving wave, and that moving wave is basically just generated by a piezo that's attached to that crystal. And in that, this moving wave basically generates a periodic modulation of the diffractive index, and then essentially you get a diffraction of the laser beam. And that diffraction um, is then proportional um, to the frequency of the RF wave that you send through the crystal. So if I change that RF wave, I can basically tune the angle of the laser beam, how it comes out of the acoustic optical deflector. So this is the basic principle of this thing. Now, um, what we do is we drive these uh, crystals with multiple frequencies. So if you drive it with multiple frequencies, you get multiple beams out, each at a certain uh, diffraction angle. And then using the control in the RF space, I could switch off one of the frequencies or move it around. I can basically then switch on and off beams or move them out. So that's uh, the first kind of control principle that we use. And you can do this in 1D here, this is shown here, and then you can cross AOTs, for example, to basically make copies of a 1D array of beams. So this is shown, this is shown here. Um, so uh, with this technique, you can generate pretty large scale arrays. So here's a, a picture, this is just a light field, not atoms, just to be clear, of 100 by 100. So you can make up to 10,000 or more in, uh, depending on which AOT you use. So that's by itself uh, not, uh, the biggest challenge, the challenge is to fill them with atoms. So they have to be deep enough and then I have to control everything correctly. Okay, so again, now you stick this tweezer array into a, a cold cloud of atoms and let it disperse. And then you take an image. And as I mentioned, um, it's a stochastic loading process where you have either zero or one atom in a, in, in a per site. And here I'm showing a few experimental shots where you just repeat that thing. So you stick the tweezer array into the atomic cloud, you let the atomic cloud disperse and then you take an image. Um, you see an image and then you start from scratch. Okay, so there's uh, some sort of a video where you see that and you see that in every shot, I hope this uh, transmits correctly over Zoom, you have a different basically pattern. So different types of tweezers are things. So it's a completely stochastic process with about 50% probability you have a tweezer. That's good, okay? Now um, you can average these pictures, you know, and you get something nice like this, but that's of course like a little bit cheating. So in, in most applications, for example, for computing or simulation, I actually need something that's defect free uh, in each shot. So really I need some sort of a mechanism to generate the defect free arrays. Um, so how do we do that? And uh, the basic scheme for this is now um, called atom by atom assembly. Um, so the idea is again, you stick a tweezer array into a magneto optical trap. Uh, and then what you do is you take one of these fluorescence images and in these fluorescence images, you can basically identify uh, which trap is full, which trap is empty. And then using the control in the RF frequency realm uh, with the acoustic optic reflector, I can basically switch off tweezers um, that are, uh, that are not filled. So I just identify them and identify which frequency generates which tweezer, I switch off the not, the not filled ones. And then I shuffle everything around by moving frequencies around on the, on the RF side into a compact defect free array. So that's a simple, simple scheme. Um, and then, uh, so here's an image, for example, or video where you see before and after images for 1D array of 100 tweezers. So there's 100 tweezers in 1D and you see every time about 50 of them are filled and then we compactify it here in these images, it's, it's done to the left. So you see this is a before uh, rearrangement and after rearrangement. And you see that in most cases you see something defect free like this after the compression process, basically. And the nice thing is because of the control you have in, in generating the tweezer arrays, you can, for example, vary that uh, geometry that you choose basically shot by shot. So you can basically compactify and move them around in, in, in certain configurations, depending on the problem that you want to study. Okay. So by now, um, this is a technique that's used in a few groups in the world. So the original um, you know, uh, results were out of Harvard and Provo is for my postdoc, for example. 
uh, and, and Paris. And then uh, there's some earlier work actually by a group at KAIS that's, that was pretty influential to us. And then I think the original proposal is actually from Dave Weiss that has a slightly different scheme that he subsequently also realized in optical letters. And now there's a few other groups, including ourselves at Caltech, that do that. Just the basic features, just to kind of like, you know, um, have them on paper. Um, you can generate defect free arrays of around 50, maybe 100 or a little larger atoms in, in 1D, 2D, and quasi 3D. Atomic distances are adjustable. Uh, between a, a micrometer and typically 100 micrometers, you can have flexible geometries and it's uh, much faster than um, traditional cold atom experiments. And that's mainly because you you uh, skip that evaporative cooling step that you normally have to generate BECs. And actually that um, that bullet point is, is, is often not mentioned, but it's actually extremely important for everyday uh, work with these, uh, with these arrays. And it also helps you a lot to gather statistics very quickly uh, if you want to do many part experiments, for example, that have non-trivial correlations that you want to get. Um, also, if you want to debug things. So, so experimenting with these visa arrays is um, quite a bit different than, say, doing experiments with Bose Einstein condensates, what I did in my PhD. And then uh, just just concerning the limits, so that's not perfect, right? So um, in terms of how how large can I make these arrays? So the first one is the number of traps. So I don't have infinite laser power to make these traps deep enough um, to to trap atoms out of a cold cloud. So there's a fundamental uh, a limit also in terms of how deep tweezers have to be for imaging and so on. So there's a, a limit on, on how large can I make this. And then also you have to imagine that. Um, I can I can make an, a, a mistake for each of the atoms. So some sort of my probability of making a mistake actually scales exponentially uh, with the system size uh, in a sense that if I have a single atom probability of doing everything right, everything right means I, I, I can uh, identify an atom, I do the identification correctly. So I have to image correctly. I move an atom and then I image it again and see if it's there. So if I make no mistake, in, in this process, I would say I, I, I have a, a success for a single atom. And then there's a success probability for a single atom. That's how, how often do I do it right for a given atom. And then if I think about the global probability to do everything right, it's a, the individual success probability to the power of n. So it's exponentially hard actually to do that. That means each of the steps has to be carried out with very high fidelity if you want to make this halfway scalable. Okay, so that's also also important limitation. That's, that's not often talked about too much. Okay. So before I move forward, let me ask if there are questions about that first part. I guess I'm saying maybe everyone has heard about this at some point. Uh, yeah. One one question. Um, you, you, your your first reference. Can can you go can you go several slides back? Uh, there was one 2004 paper that. Uh... 2001, maybe. 2001, yes, sorry, seminal uh, paper, I missed it. Uh, yeah, good, uh, got it. Thank you. <laughs> I can share the slides later, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So this was, this was um, this, these guys in Paris, I mean, often as someone in the French system, they start with things pretty early on and they, they started tweezer trapping and, and, and studying these things like, very early actually in the, in the 90s already. And this was uh, one of the earliest papers where they really saw individual atoms and tweezers and, and, and figured all of that stuff out. And we have also a, a question in the chat from Bjorn, which is, uh, what do you mean when you say quasi 3D tweezer arrays? Oh, I should explain this. Yeah, this comes every time. <laughs> I should be bad. Um, let me go there. So quasi 3D is, just means that the extension in the third direction is not as large as in the other directions. So, um, right, I mean, you have a high resolution objective that has just a certain field of view. So that would be basically the 2D plane. And then there's a certain a depth of view um, with which you can, you know, generate things. And then it's kind of hard to go much beyond the test of you. There's tricks, of course, with, with holographic trapping to go to, go to quasi 3D then. It means you can make a few layers. And eventually, if you want to go 3D, you, you could use lattices. That's also possible, but it hasn't been done to that degree. Even Dave Weiss, he also uses only a few layers. This, this has to do also with the imaging. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to image single atoms in 3D and reconstruct it immediately. You kind of have to go layer by layer. Uh, so that's why it's easier to go in, into two, di two directions. Uh, and then the third one is basically along the imaging axis. I mean, it's, you, you can generate stuff that's 3D. That's not a problem. But then you kind of have to slice in the image. And that's the tricky part. And also the rearrangement to do it like immediately in 3D is not completely trivial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's an interesting avenue for future research. How to do that, right? OK. Good. Just just ask questions. It's okay. I'll cut down in the end. There's a few slides I can cut in case we go too long. All right. Great. So um. Okay. So now these atoms sit in the tweezer array. 
And the typical distance is maybe a micrometer, but at, at this one micrometer distance, because they're neutral atoms in their ground state, their interaction energy is extremely low. It's so low that it's basically useless. So the question is, how do I really um, generate interactions that are that are useful now in, in this context of quantum science? And there's a few different uh, options here. Uh, I'll, I'll mainly focus on what we call dipole-dipole interactions or use dipole uh, interactions. And you can get this uh, by going to Rydberg states, for example, and I'll explain this in detail. Or you could also trap molecules. And there's now experiments, for example, at Harvard and Kangwe Nis group, where she assembles molecules, even in tweezers, uh, where you can have, for example, if you do it right, a permanent dipole moment that you could use. Um, uh, another option is to stick tweezer arrays into cavities one way or another. So here I show an example of a photonic crystal cavity. So you can have, for example, uh, a real or virtual exchange of photons through a cavity. I think Dan has worked on these things more re most recently. And then traditionally in cold atoms, um, contact interaction is, is of course uh, what we use uh, in, in when we make BECs. And you could realize this, for example, here by letting atoms tunnel, and then you get an on-site contact interaction within a tweezer, and you would then realize more or less a Hubbard type model. Um, so again, I will focus mostly mostly uh, on this avenue using dipole dipole interactions, but I should say all of these things are pursued in multiple labs uh, across the world. So for example, photomediated interaction, Dan's working on uh, of Monica at, at Stanford, and then Misha has an experiment for that, and also uh, Jeff at, at Caltech. And then Hubbard type interaction, Cindy Riegel, for example, has experiments studying these things, or Selim Jochen in, in Heidelberg. So all of these things are studied somewhere. Okay, so I, I'll focus on, on Rootback interactions and, um, and Maybe it will become clear why why I think this is one of the most suitable ways of making these these arrays interact in a very controlled fashion. Okay, so let me let me jump uh, in here. So I, I'll build on. Oh, is there someone having a question? Look at that. Okay, maybe. Not. So I'll build on um, what uh, Dave said already. Um, so so what are rootback atoms to start with? So I kind of repeat uh, maybe one thing here. So if you think about uh, atoms in the electronic ground state, they're extremely small. So the electronic wave function is very small. And then you can go to this very highly excited state, so very high, meaning a very high principal quantum number. And then the most uh, basic feature, at least the way I understand it very intuitively, is that the electronic wave function just becomes very, very large. And actually, the first time I really looked at the numbers, I was a little bit surprised. It's, it's really can be multiple hundreds of nanometers. And, and that means, as a main consequence, is that the electronic wave function with respect to the core becomes very polarizable. So the whole thing can basically wobble around quite easily if you have a tiny applied electric field. And as a consequence of that, you can have very strong so-called induced dipole-dipole interaction between the Rydberg states. So Rydberg states by themselves don't have a permanent dipole moment, but you can, they can, uh, they have a fluctuating dipole moment, quantum mechanically speaking. That fluctuation basically uh, introduces a so-called induced dipole-dipole interaction that uh, goes with one over R6 in, in, in the distance, and is often also called van der Waals interaction, something you've heard many, many times. And um, importantly, uh, the prefactor for this uh, van der Waals interaction actually scales with the principal quantum number to the power 11. And if you plug in some numbers for typical um, uh, principal quantum numbers that you can that you can use, you see, for example, that you have an interaction shift of uh, 10 gigahertz or even more at typical distances in these visa arrays. And then if you make the distance larger, you can basically dial it down to a very small interaction shift. So this can go from really ginormous, uh, much, much larger than any other energy scale you would have typically with neutral atoms to something you can basically dial in that's almost negligible just by changing the distance. So in a way, the interaction range or the strengths is extremely well suited to the typical atomic distances in these visa arrays. So that's maybe kind of a take home message. There. Now, um, how does this work in, in more detail? Or let me ask other questions about this. It's just a basic, you know, Rootback slide. I know there's a you know, broad. So there's there's one question in the chat from Francisco, um, yeah. which says, uh, can you can you comment a bit on the motional degrees of freedom? Should we think of each atom tightly pinned, or is there a finite number of motional excitations? I guess this is back to the the atoms in the tweezers. Can these be used? Motional excitations be used as a resource, and how does the reassembly affect this degree of freedom? So I think this is getting back to the, the um, trap excitation. Yeah, I'll actually talk about this a little bit later. Um, I'll talk about cooling in, in a second, actually. So, so okay. maybe, maybe I can I can I can wait for that. But just to answer very quickly, let me try to go back. Um, okay, maybe the tweezer is not here. So I mean, the atoms are in the tweezer, and they're. Um, in most of these experiments, not ground state cool. So they, they kind of um, swing around a little bit. 
And then um, whether or not to start with, this is negligible or uh, depends on exactly what you're doing. But uh, for these Rittberg interactions, it's it's more or less negligible because all, all of the energy scales are much larger than uh, the, the emotional degrees of freedom. So for example, you will, I will show this in a second. So the Rabi frequencies, for example, that you use for going from a ground state to a Rittberg state are much, much uh, larger than all the energy splittings uh, in, in the trap. And, and, and also larger than the uh, average uh, thermal energy. Um, that, that's so, so kind of like basically the energy scales just gets overwritten mostly. But it's not completely true, of course, then you can have things such as Doppler shifts, for example, that, that uh, act as a perturbation on, on top of what you do. So that's to start with. So to start with, um, it, it's small, but not completely negligible. Maybe that's the answer. And then and because of that, you actually want to be very cool. And I'll come back to that. Um, then can you use it as a resource? Um, Maybe, but probably you don't want to. <laughs> Let's put it like that. That's the answer. Because it's like emotional degrees of freedoms are notoriously hard, hard to control in microscopic traps, I would say, like that. So I would not use it say, as a qubit. That's, that's not necessarily what you want to do. So it's like for qubits, you want to use internal degrees of freedoms of the atoms, ideally. Okay, I hope this answers the, the question for now. I'll show actually emotional spectrum in a, in a second. Okay. More questions? What's the another one? Uh, there's another chat question from Sumanta that says, uh, for Rydberg atoms, why does the dipole moment fluctuate even if the atom is excited to a fixed a state with fixed principal quantum number? I think that is true for all states. I mean, you can calculate uh, fluctuate. I mean, it's like, like okay, this is a little bit, I'm, I'm doing a little bit mumbo jumbo here, right? I mean, what do I mean exactly? So, uh, so, so you have the dipole moment operator, that's expectation value of R, where R is the distance from, you know, from the core. And that one vanishes, but then you look at fluctuations R square, doesn't necessarily vanish. Um, is that really the origin of a van der Waals interactions in a sense, at least hand wavy? So you have something that fluctuates and then it uses something here and then you get these interactions. But in practice, you would just do a, a full brute force diagonalization calculation. That's how I think about it. I don't think too much about this, to be honest. Like you can like solve this like uh, on a computer even by hand in certain cases. So it's like, uh, it's essentially, um, forces, right? I mean, it's literally, uh, you have the electron. And then th the point is, of course, that if I have a single, if I have a, say, a single hydrogen atom, and I go to this Rydberg state, then I can calculate all the eigenstates. And they're actually eigenstates, right? But now, if I have a second hydrogen atom, and, and they're close by, I mean, it, it's not clear that your eigenstates are still correct, right? So, and then you have to restart your calculation from scratch with two cores and two electrons. And then what you will see is that essentially your levels, they just shift in a particular way that have to do with the fact that you get additional forces or additional potentials from, from the nearby nearby atoms. And, and this shift, uh, if you calculate this then uh, to, to lowest order, you can do perturbation calculation, for example, has a one over R6 tail. That's, that's maybe the simplest explanation for that. That's how I think about it. And you can explain that one over R6 tail hand wavy with fluctuated atom. Things. Okay, let me move forward. Um, so how, how does it like look like in now in an array? So in an array, I have a few atoms, and then I, I excite them from a state that I will call G from now on to one of these very highly excited rootback atoms. So rootback state. So G is a ground state or close to ground state, and R will be a state with a very high principal quantum numbers. And they have an atomic transition frequency that I call U A here. And then I drive this uh, with a laser and a certain Rabi frequency that basically just controls. Uh, how fast will I go from this state G to state R? And it's controlled by the laser intensity. And then um, the interaction between atoms is now controlled by the distance. And then importantly, um, like as I mentioned, this Van der Waals interaction is only very strong if at, uh, both atoms are in the Rydberg state. So, and then if you think about two atoms, you have a level structure that kind of looks like this. If both atoms are in the ground state, they don't shift as a function of distance. If both, one atom is in the Rydberg state, they don't shift as a function of distance. But if both atoms are in these Rydberg states, um, you have a shift that goes one over R6. So they shift kind of here. So you can basically control the interaction now by the distance. Okay. And you can control uh, if you excite them basically with laser intensity. So more precisely, you can match map this onto a, a spin model by just introducing a Pauli operators, uh, as projectors and so on, and, and, and transition uh, operators uh, between these two states. And then if you just think about the single particle physics in a rotating frame, you make a bunch of transformations. And then you will see that 
basically each of these atoms has a sigma x term that is controlled by the laser intensity, and then there's a so-called sigma c term or longitudinal term that's controlled by the laser detuning. So this is the single particle physics uh, of your Hamiltonian. And then the interaction term has projectors onto Rydberg states. So only if you're in a Rydberg state, you have an interaction. And then you have an interaction matrix before that. And then the interaction matrix basically is controlled by the distance uh, with one over R6 together with the C6 coefficients that you have. So you can basically tune this piece by spacing and then this piece uh, using laser, laser uh, drive uh, with different frequencies uh, or different intensities. You could make all of the single side uh, resolved and so on, but I won't go, go there for now. So this is some sort of the basic Hamiltonian that you would get if you take an atom, uh, an array of atoms in their ground state and then start to excite them uh, to the back states. Okay, questions about that? So now, without going into, into a lot of details, this, this Hamiltonian, has been used uh, along like many different lines of, of research, uh, most notably in the context of quantum simulation. Um, so there's a lot of uh, studies, for example, on quantum magnetism. So if, if you look at this Hamiltonian, um, if you write this term, for example, in sigma C matrices, it's a, it's a, it's a so-called Ising interaction. So this gives you what is called a transverse field longitudinal Ising uh, uh, Hamiltonian with a long range interaction or like a quasi long range interaction, which is one over six. And has extremely rich physics in 1D and 2D that has been studied in, in, in various different papers. Uh, so there's uh, different types of quantum phase transitions that you can study, for example. For example here, so this is one direction, another direction is really many body dynamics. So they can have very non-trivial uh, dynamical uh, features in there. So for, for example, many body scars, uh, this is a new type of, of eigenstates or like dynamical phenomena that has been observed, for example, in Rydberg states. And there's also um, uh, results in, in the realm of topological physics. Um, this is, however, not exactly with this Hamiltonian. So there's different Hamiltonians you can engineer if you play a few more tricks. And if you do it right, for example, here, uh, this is one of Antoine's papers in Paris. You can observe a so-called symmetry protected topological uh, uh, physics in, in, in Bondi. And, and there's a lot of open ground there. You can, for example, study conformal field theories. There's ideas to study lattice gauge theory. There's things like quasi-particle confinement, and there's all kinds of ideas to, to understand the quantum chaos better. And there's some more recent results on, on theory and those experiments for spin liquids in 2D that can be realized with this type of system. So that's some sort of the many body side. And then the other side of the things I would call quantum computing or entangled state engineering. So this is an approach where I say, okay, um, let's say I start with making gates. Right? So I, I want to make a two qubit gate or just entangle uh, two atoms. And I'll, I'll come back to some of this in more detail later. So there's some results there. Um, there's a, a question here. I'll, I'll come back to the question in a second. So there's a few results here in, in terms of two qubit entanglement. And then one always has to um, distinguish if, these, if the entanglement is generated in, in basically the qubit I just showed you, which is uh, in, in a qubit that's defined by a ground in a Rydberg state or if it's uh, an entanglement that's in a, in a, in a low-lying state, say in a hyperfine state of an atom. And, and uh, typically the values before we started on this ground to Rydberg were around maybe 97%. And up to now, I think the records for hyperfine entanglement is also 97%. Um, and then um, there's some sort of two qubit gates maybe, and then you can think of other things like, okay, how, how well can I generate a GHG state? Uh, you can use this uh, Hamiltonian uh, for example, in a, in a quasi adiabatic sweep where you change parameters in a very clever fashion that you start with a state that's with all atoms down and then you end up automatically, for example, in a GHG state. And the record there is around 20 qubits and that's um, competitive with other platforms, I would say. Maybe the gate values are not completely yet. I'll, I'll show some recent results from us on this ground Rydberg uh, fidelity where we now have, have higher values. Uh, but in terms of the many body physics, it's an extremely uh, competitive platform. I'll pause again for uh, uh, questions. And then here is Alp asking a question, R, G, R, R, G. Uh, he's asking about dipole interactions between G, R, and R, G. Yeah, that's, that's a little a tricky question because, um, yeah. Maybe I answer that question in private. So, okay, maybe I could quickly go quickly there. So I think he's asking about at these states, um, if, if there's a, a role that dipole 
spin exchange interactions or like really direct dipole interactions play in here. That's, I think, the way I understand the question. Um, I think this depends on which transition you use, actually. And in, in actually, in, uh, in, in rubidium, I think this is practically zero because it's actually you go from S to S um, via two photon. Uh, but uh, in, in, uh, in alkaline earth, what we do, it's a P to S. So it might be there. But as far as like, I have actually never looked up the number, but it's really, really tiny to my knowledge. <laughs> so, so it exists, but it's like the, the, the it's, it's so small that it doesn't matter compared to the energy scales. But you can have it, so maybe let's, let's, let's like, so you can, if you do a different encoding between, uh, say, for example, if you, if your two qubits are not a ground in the Rydberg state, but two Rydberg states that you say you drive with a, a microwave, then this can be the dominating effect. This is direct type type of interaction between the uh, two different atoms. Okay, good. So this is some sort of a broad overview of what has been done. And then most of these things have been done with alkali atoms, and I'll come back to this. And then, um, so this is all nice, but let me talk a little bit about the limitations that are also important in terms, in the context of our center here. So what are the really, the limitations of this whole story? Um, so the first really fundamental limitation is the Rydberg lifetime. So um, this is typically a hundred microseconds. So this is some sort of you have to be faster than that. And then in alkali atoms, usually you go via two photon transition uh, in most cases, and then you get uh, a, effectively a shorter lifetime because you get admixtures of these intermediate states that you have to go through. So this typically gives you around 50 microseconds. And then additionally, and, and this we are starting to understand more and more in, in all excruciating details is how finer temperature of the atoms, for example, um, uh, uh, modifies the dynamics. And this was a question already. So if you have this excitation laser and the atoms mumble around in your trap, you can have, so, for example, a Doppler shift. And this Doppler shift gives you a noise term in the Hamiltonian. And additionally, and that's a very, very um, important uh, fact, is the is laser noise. So your laser by itself is not completely clean. And that actually matters here. So if you have laser excitation, you can try to stab it to a ULE cavity and whatnot, but you will still have phase noise in the laser. You will still have amplitude noise in the laser. And these types of noise sources are pretty non-trivial. They're non-Markovian and have very complicated frequency spectrum and so on. And, and they have a non-trivial effect on this dynamics. And, and we understand this in, in more and more detail. So this is actually an important limitation. And, and, and I'll show you some you know, results, for example, that we think are just purely limited by laser noise later. Um, uh, so this is some sort of uh, uh, time scale set either by atomic coherence or coherence by your laser. Okay. Then there's another time scale that's pretty important. That's the so-called trap off time. So these experiments are typically done in free flight. So what does it mean? So I, I trap atoms in the tweezers, and then I have them maybe wobble around close to the bottom of the trap. And then before I do the Rydberg physics, I would switch off the trap. And atoms are basically doing all this dynamics with this Hamiltonian, or if I'd make a gate, are often just in free flight. So that means that tweezers are completely off. Why can I do that? I can do that because uh, the energy scales of the motion are much smaller than all the energy scales that I have in my excitation. So I can do these Rydberg operations almost instantaneously compared to how fast an atom moves. And um, but, but it's not completely instantaneously um, because I make this typical time of flight experiments where I let an atom uh, escape and I try to recatch it. It gives me around 10 to 20 microseconds, typically in alkali atoms. Now with alkaline earths, we have maybe a hundred, um, but because they're extremely cold, but this gives you some sort of a maximum time scale uh, for how long you can do these experiments. Why do we do that? So why do we really uh, go into this regime where we switch off the traps? This is because typically in most trapping wavelengths, um, these Rydberg states are extremely strongly anti-trapped. That means this anti-trap uh, gives you um, a, a light shift on top of the transition that is actually very, very bad for your coherence. Um, so you wanna avoid that typically. So that's really the reason for that. So that's an additional time scale, and that just gives you some sort of an upper limit for how long you can wait for certain things. Okay? Whether or not you reach that time scale in, in, in terms of intrinsic decoherence is a different different question. Okay. Uh, and then you have to compare all of this versus achievable uh, Rabi frequency. So that's the uh, excitation frequency with how fast can I go from the ground to the rootback state. And typically this is maybe one to a few megahertz uh, with, with the alkali atom. So often if I just crank up the Rabi frequency one way or another, I just gain a uh, compared to typical decoherence mechanisms in terms I can just beat them. Okay. Um, and then there's additional limits, of course, in system size. And then another limit is root by detection fidelity with traditional methods is typically around 90, 98% in terms of detection. Okay. 
All right, let me pause for a second and, and ask for questions. Just give me a chance to try. Uh, in the chat, Rob asks, are you using a one or two photon transition? Yeah, so the results I showed so far were all from alkali atoms, and they um, they go with a two photon transition in, in rubidium, for example. There's very various, various different excitation schemes, but most of the results that you know of in terms of gates and so on are two photon transition. And now the um, results I'll show now for alkaline earth atoms are all with a um, with a one photon transition. I would say. And I'll, I'll show you how this works actually with this one photon transition. There's, there's a trick involved. And the two photon transition, you would why do you actually need that? So you could try to go directly from a ground state to a rootback state. So that's some sort of two reasons. Uh, typically, a ground state is S, and then the rootback states that you want for most applications is also S, and then you just don't have a direct um, dipole matrix element, so you have to go via P state in the video. That's one reason. And the other one is you could go to P, for example, but often in most elements, the transition wavelengths are kind of um, uh, inconvenient. There's a few elements, so cesium, for example, where it's halfway convenient, but if you go to rubidium, for example, it's in a deep UV. So it's really a mess to actually work with it. So, so typically it's done with two photon transition, but there's single photon excitation pathways from S to P rootback states, for example. And then there's another Nadal interesting question. It's a completely different story okay. and I'll explain it. And what's the other question? Can you turn on a um, lattice? Yeah, I'll come back to this. Yeah, the other question is, can you turn on a lattice for the strontium plus ion core during interactions? I'll, I'll come back to that. Yeah. Yes, the question is, uh, the answer is probably yes. Okay, more questions? This was almost like a historic, you know, just the kind of basics so far. Okay, no, more, no more questions. Okay, then let me move forward. So some of the things then, you know, we have been starting to ask in my group at Caltech when I started out is, can we potentially improve uh, upon these limitations and, and what has been done um, using alkaline earth atoms? Uh, so this really using two valence electrons and just instead of just one. And then maybe there are different, you know, qualitatively different applications that we could reach uh, with that. So now I'll try to talk about all of this. So again, so what are two valence electron atoms? So they're in the second column and uh, have two valence electrons, as, as mentioned, they're often called alkaline earth atoms or alkaline earth-like atoms. And here's an example of, of strontium-88, for example, since it sits right next to it, it just has one, one electron more. And then the most prominently, um, they're actually used in optical clocks. Um, and, and why? Uh, because of that particular level structure that David uh, introduced, you have uh, uh, transitions that are nominally dipole forbidden. So they're, they're only enabled by higher order processes and they, they lead to very narrow uh, optical lines. So, so this is here, for example, in strontium, you can have the so-called intercombination line that we use for cooling that is only seven kilohertz wide or the so-called clock transition. And there, I think maybe the lifetime of that state is not even known, but it's extremely long. So it's extremely narrow uh, transition. And these transitions now um, are used typically in optical clocks first for cooling, and then you can basically stabilize the laser, for example, to this, to this transition. Uh, and this are, um, to date, I would, as far as I know, the most stable uh, 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 clocks that you can build, for example, with uterpium or strontium atoms. Okay, so these lines are extremely narrow compared to typical lines say, in alkali atoms that have multiple megahertz line width. Okay, so these are really the kind of the draw from these guys. And then you can ask yourself, can you use this, for example, in this context? And I'll show you a few examples now. So what we have been uh, wanting to do then over the years, and we did it then, is to really build um, a, a race of alkaline earth atoms in optical tweezers and use them for quantum science applications. And we did this you know, in, in multiple steps over the years. So we showed some first imaging and, and cooling results around 2018, and then showed extremely high fidelity imaging in 2019. Then in 2020, uh, we started to work on, on Rydberg results and show high fidelity Rydberg control and entanglement. And then uh, also the technical result is, is actually to build an atomic clock basically in tweezer arrays that, that we have been you know, working on. So now I'll walk you through these results, um, at least the first part now, and then uh, show this a little bit in more detail. And then I come back at the very end of the talk to the tweezer clock story. Okay, so let me let me walk you through that. So uh, we use these transitions in different ways. So let me start with uh, what we call a cooling transition. So that's a seven kilohertz line. And then um, 
most importantly, and this was some sort of a draw for me uh, to go to strontium, is that the 7 kilohertz line uh, resolves the motional degrees uh, of in the tweezer completely. So these motional levels uh, of atoms in the tweezer typically have a sp splitting of around 100 kilohertz. So this is wider than this transition. That means you can do direct single photon sideband cooling here. So you can just excite on the sideband and then basically try to cool in the tweezer. And we have seen this. Uh, in one of our first papers. So this is a sideband spectrum of an atom in a tweezer where you see a strongly suppressed sideband here, and then you can basically see that you're pretty close to the motional ground state after, after this cooling sequence. We also use this um, 7 kilohertz line in a different way. This is what we call a narrow line Sisyphus cooling mechanism. And again, it has to do with the fact that this um, um, transition is so narrow. So typically, for example, the absolute trap depth that you have is around maybe 20 megahertz or 10 megahertz or something like this. And then you have a transition that's seven kilohertz wide. So now if you have a situation where your ground and excited state sees a tri different trapping pos uh, potential, then you can basically uh, uh, resolve some sort of uh, energy shells in the tweezer. So you can, for example, shine in laser light such that it's only resonant on the bottom of the trap. Right, and because the shift is much, much larger than the, than the line width. And that's kind of nice. So you, now you're in some sort of a textbook Sisyphus cooling uh, mechanism. So an atom rolls down here, gets excited here, then rolls up a steeper hill, and then maybe gets the excited. Of course, much more complicated in reality. This is just a sketch, but that's some sort of like a, a typical uh, 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 Sisyphus cooling you know, mechanism, as, as you would see it sometimes in, in, in uh, laser cooling text, uh, textbooks. And we see this also, um, you know, in, in these tweezers and, and maybe have seen most of the like, clearest uh, you know, examples of this. And, and in fact, we use the Sisyphus cooling mechanism, exactly the one that's actually shown here uh, throughout uh, for cooling and imaging actually. And, and there's some sort of an extremely uh, robust uh, method here. This one is particular to cool close to the emotional ground state. Uh, even in this case, you only need one laser beam. So you can do 3D cooling with one laser beam because it all comes basically, the recoil momentum for the cooling come up, all comes from the trap. So you don't need even counter propagating uh, beams. So, so we can cool um, close to the ground state with just one beam actually. And this um, the fact that it's one, it's robust, but the other one is that we are actually close to the ground state is important for coherence. So it's important for Ritter coherence. It matters for imaging fidelity. I'll show this in a second. And then it also matters later on for this clock line control in alkaline earth atoms. Okay, so that's the cooling part. How do we image? How does this actually work in alkaline earth atoms? So we um, shine in two laser beams, basically. One is a beam that tries to cool atoms close to the ground state or as much as we can. And the other one is a beam uh, that we use for fluorescent imaging and heats up the atoms. So why does it heat up the atoms? So you shine in a beam, you scatter photons. Every time you scatter a photon, you're gonna get heat up a little bit. And these are the photons we want to observe. And then these are the photons we just use to counteract basically the heating that comes from the fluorescent light, right? So um, this is some sort of the typical scheme. And then you can play with the different parameters to optimize your imaging. And then you get imaging like images like this, for example. So, and again, the light that we observe is this blue broad transition here. So this is a single shot in a tweezer array. So you see a tweezer, an atom, you know, at some of the sites. And then this is an average image, and you see this is pretty high quality already. And then uh, in practice, what you do is you you basically uh, you know you draw a, a box around an atom, and then you count how many photons do I get in that box, and you try to do some sort of a thresholding argument. And then um, up to a certain number of observed photons, they can come from noise or from background light, for example. You would say, okay, I have zero atoms in that box, and this is associated with a tweezer. Then, or I have one atom if I'm above that threshold. And then I don't show this here, but if you go in that histogram a little bit further out, you don't see a second peak. So you actually, if you do it right, never have two atoms. So that's some sort of the logic. And now you see that the thresholding here is very good. So there's a, a white region where you have nothing in between. And then you can see, okay, how high is your fidelity? Fidelity is actually a, a bad word that's often used in imaging. I shouldn't even use it here, but I use it because everyone uses it. It's actually accuracy is the right word. So there's a certain accuracy with which you can distinguish zero from one. And the accuracy we have is about four nines in this case, if we do everything right. That's one important characteristic of this system. Another one is what we call survival. Survival is a number that's the probability um, 
if I have an atom in an image, so if I if I you know identify an atom, what's my probability that I still have the atom after the image? So I could identify it correctly, but I could have lost it. Okay, and then the probability that I still have it is around nine, three nines here. And that probability is also very important, say, for this atom by atom. Essentially, say I identify an atom, but I still want to have it, right? I want to move it around and make a defect free array, right? So it actually enters, and that's a number that should be quoted whenever if somebody talks about this. Okay, so um, the keys for that is very long lifetime. So in, in this cases, for example, if we just have the cooling light on in these tweezers, we can keep atoms for around seven minutes, which is uh, very, very long for these types of experiments. Okay, so this is important again. Uh, these numbers for atom by atom assembly, remember, is p to the n scaling. You know, if we now have these numbers, you could scale up to maybe a thousand atoms reasonably, just in terms of imaging fidelity. That's one. And also, it's nice to have high imaging or like high detection fidelity if you want to debug, you know, quantum operations. Okay. Let me stop you again for questions if someone has, has a question. That's, that's really just the basic stuff. How do we cool it and how do we image it? This were the two slides. You know. Just to get like a little bit of aim office and then we are. Manuel, I missed. How long is your imaging pulse? Um, we go, depends on maybe 50 milliseconds or something like this. And then you can go through the numbers. So this, this, this survival, you get out if you take uh, e to the minus uh, whatever 50 milliseconds divided by uh, like a minute or something like that. So that's 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 that gives you that number. Um, you could make it longer, like there's some sort of compromise between fidelity and survival and so on. And, and, or, or to be maximally honest, this also depends on like the day, right? <laughs> Everyone who does AMO experiments know that these experiments have good days and bad days. These are these are kind of good day numbers, right? If you have bad day, they so there's an interesting. Numbers. Question in the yeah. chat from Wes. Um, since there's more information in the image than just the total counts, does that let you do better than just? Some... Uh, yeah, that is a good question. So, um, yeah, we actually do it slightly different than this box thing. I, I, I don't want to get into this. We actually fit point spread functions. We do some sort of a reconstruction of a point spread function and some sort of a maximum likelihood mm -hmm. estimation. And uh, that's one, but that's not using correlation. I mean, maybe. Best wants to get a correlation. You could do machine learning on top of this stuff, for example, and we thought about this and haven't done it. So, um, I mean, you could get maybe marginally better, but it's not a fundamental thing, I think. If, if you have an idea, I'd be more than happy to hear that. Uh, I'm always interested in this very basic stuff, you know, how to prepare atoms, how do you image them? Because in the end, that's really what matters. I mean, if you want to make progress, you have to work on that stuff at some point. And uh, maybe I periodically do it every four years or so. <laughs> Seems to be my career so far. Um, but uh, you do something new. Maybe now it's time again. But this one, yeah, so we don't just count boxes. It's a bit more complicated. So we actually know the point spread function. We kind of fit the point spread function, and then we can actually we look at a histogram of the fit parameters of the point spread function, uh, which, which is slightly more accurate than just counting, um, counting these things. More questions? Yeah, it's good to have a little bit of discussion and questions already during the talk. How hard would it be to only use the cooling light for detection? Uh, not hard at all, and we have done it. Um, is it better? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. This one is nice because, so the question is, so why do I need this blue transition, right? I could just cool and, and detect on that cooling thing. That's all right. So you can do that. Um, so there's a, there's a maximum number of, of photons you can scatter here. Per time interval, so it's a seven kilohertz transition, so that gives you a pi times seven kilohertz maximum uh, scattering rate. So that's about twenty-one kilohertz or something like that. Um, that that's at some sort of a time scale of how fast you can do it. Here you can control it arbitrarily. I mean, I can go to like pi times 30, uh, 30 megahertz. That's a lot. So um, in practice, we use about fifty kilohertz or so scattering rate. So it's slightly higher than what you could do here. Uh, the other advantage of using that thing is that I mean, you can just Control the, the cooling and, and the heating kind of independently, so that gives you it's much easier to kind of just come to terms with optimizing it. That's one. And then another one that's actually fundamental is that um, here you can just use dichroic mirror to separate out light in a way. So, so here I have that. In a way, like some of that cooling light is not completely orthogonal in how I set up. Uh, to the imaging path, so sometimes you get more scattering. So, so this guy you can make like really, really like. Like you can make it very tightly focused, such a very, very little background right from that, and then you can filter out all of this. So there's a few tricks you can play there. But in principle, you can do that. We have done that before. It's not, it's not, not, not hard. 
but there's also no good reason to do it. The other one is like, okay, maybe one more advantage is that this one is a is is a, a lower wavelength than this one, so that means you get a little bit of a boost in the resolution. But um, if you look at these point spread functions, they're actually much too large. We still don't know why. There's something weird going on. I think our imaging system has a lot of aberration in the imaging class, but we don't care because it doesn't matter. Okay, I hope this answers the question. So it's not hard, but it's not clear why you would do it. Let's put it like that. More questions in the relatively. Okay, so maybe maybe let me move forward. Okay, so this is the kind of imaging story. Now let me uh, let me get to the Rydberg piece. You know, okay, Rydberg physics. So um, so this was one reason why we why we really uh, picked uh, uh, strontium for alkaline earth atoms. So. I showed you earlier that in alkali atoms, typically you go by a two photon transition. You also do this in alkaline earth, but you do it in some sort of a stepwise process that helps you quite a bit. So the typical level structure here for Rydberg excitation is this. So this is an absolute ground state. And then you have this uh, 3PJ manifold. So this is a singlet to triplet transition. And these guys are long lived. In particular, this one here is extremely long lived. So this is this, the upper state in that clock transition, okay? So this is a metastable state that lives very long. So what we do now is we move all the atoms from the ground state into this metastable state. And then for the moment, because this state is so long lived on the time scale of all the physics, we can forget about the ground state. Okay, so then we're slightly excited already. And then um, we can go from here with a very nice single photon transition to the Rydberg uh, excitation. So this is an S state again, and then you can do S state Rydberg physics, which is what you want uh, with a convenient wavelength and with a very high dipole moment. The dipole moment, like the coupling moment here is a little bit hard. Dipole moment, I mean, um, the dipole moment used to really excite it. So that's, that's what really enters the Rabi frequency, which is actually quite high because the electron wave function is a little bit excited. already. Okay. Um, so this, this scheme is what we use throughout, which makes it a little bit simpler in terms of you know, exciting. And then there's a few main features. So, so again, because it's not a two photon transition and because the good wavelengths and so on, you can go to really high Rabi frequencies. That's one advantage. There's no extra decoherence from intermediate states and no extra light shifts you get. Um, atoms, as I showed you, are very cold. So this suppresses Doppler shifts to a certain degree. Um, then there's also new detection schemes you can use. I'm not going to show it because I don't have enough time. So in particular, we use a new scheme to detect these rootback states that works via auto ionization through the core that has extremely high fidelity, much higher than has been shown before. And then I think this was the question from Wes earlier. The rootback states are in principle trappable. So the reason is that, that you have two valence electrons now, right? Like, and these states, just to be clear, that we use are single electron excited states. So I take one valence electron and I put it in a very highly excited state. That means if I take, say I take the electron away, move it further away, basically what you have left with is a strontium plus ion, which has more or less just a strontium plus level structure that might be slightly perturbed from the electron that's out there. And that strontium plus ion again has optical transitions and these optical transitions I could use in principle to trap the core, right? So that means I have a completely different handle on trapping of Rydberg atoms. So they have one electron that's excited and then they have still a core left that I can use to trap. And the Rydberg states are trappable um, now via standard five-pole transitions of the core. And this has been shown, I think, um, for the first time by Jeff Thompson, actually, in, in, in this archive paper, if you're, if you're inter interested. Um, in our case, this also plays a role. So, so, um, so we, we, for example, did uh, experiments where we did Rydberg excitations with the tweezer on it in some of the papers. I don't want to talk too much about it, but it's a very important feature, I think, long term, if you think about computing and these kind of things. Okay. All right, so these are some sort of the main features and the main, main advantages. Let me move forward and show you some results from this. Um, so let's just look at bare bone Rabi oscillation. So what do we do? So we prepare these atoms in an array and we space them so far out that they basically don't interact even if they're in the Rydberg states. And then we just drive it with a laser. We drive it like non-interacting, so they're large distance, and we drive it with no detune. Okay, and then we just look at Rabi oscillations between this state and this state. So when you see a one here, then it's typically uh, in all of the graphs, you're in the ground state here. And then when you see a zero here, you're in that state. So some sort of a survival probability. Um, so and what you see is a very uh, textbook Rabi oscillation here from Brown to Rydberg with very high contrast. You can go to longer times and you see maybe up to 50 or 60 oscillations. So it looks actually quite nice. And you can look at this even in more detail. So what are all these fidelities? The fidelities are around like 99.5 or something like this. And that's really without correcting for anything. This is really bad data. So we don't correct here for state preparation or detection errors or stuff like that. So that's actually quite nice. And then um, you can also see, okay, well, how, how large is our Rabi frequency? 
Here we see maybe six to 50 megahertz with relatively moderate laser power and parameters. Um, and this was at the time the first Rydberg Rabi oscillation with single alkaline earth atoms. So this are quite, uh, quite pleased when we saw this for the first time. And I should say this was relatively easy in a sense. It's like somehow this clean transition, once you're cold and so on, it kind of gives you uh, these things almost automatically with like a, like a not too complicated laser system and so on. So now um, let's talk about uh, you know uh, interactions and, and what we can do with this. And that the simplest uh, uh, way to utilize this interactions is the so-called blockade effect. So what we do here is we assemble atoms in pairs, um, and at this distance they are extremely strongly interacting, and then the pairs are spaced so far out that pairs don't interact with each other. So you basically get copies uh, of the system coupled to the same laser system. Um, if you think about just one pair, again, this is the level structure that I showed you earlier already. So you have uh, atoms can be both in the ground state. You can have GR or RG, or you have both in the excited state. If they're far away, you get this uh, nice Rabi oscillation I just showed you. If you put them very, very close together, and if this interaction shift is much larger than your Rabi frequency, you cannot excite this doubly excited state. So it's basically shifted out of resonance. And, uh, and this is the so-called blockade, root by blockade effect. So and what happens then is that you effectively get an oscillation between this ground state here and uh, in a state where one atom is excited and you're in a superposition between RG and GR. Uh, and which superposition depends on your laser phase and the symmetry of the Hamiltonian. I don't want to go into too many details. But then you also in particular see that this excitation frequency that you have here of going from this state to this uh, band state here is actually enhanced by a square root of two. Okay, so there's a typical telltale sign that you have. We observed this very nicely in experiments. So we see this, these oscillations now, this slightly different quantity I'm plotting. So when I'm here, down here, I basically have population in this state or in these states. And we see very high contrast blockade oscillations. We see the square root of two enhancement and all these things. Um, you can go to longer times and you see many, many of these oscillations. So this is in particular, these are basically oscillations between unentangled atoms and entangled atoms um, that you can you know, do 60 times, for example. Here. Um, in terms of numbers, um, this band state fidelity with some tricks, you can basically read it out. I want to go into details for that. And we see about 98% if you don't correct for any errors and a little bit above 99 if you correct for state preparation and measurement errors. Um, and this is quite a bit higher than what had been observed previously, which was around 97 or something like that. Okay. So this, uh, this, and then again, this is important longer term because it's a very basic building block uh, for many gates and, and, and also for uh, this quantum simulation directions that I've shown. And then also for us in longer term in quantum metrology, and I'll come back to this. Okay, before I move forward, let me ask if there are questions about that part. So that's the basic part about um, grid back physics with alkaline earth atoms. Possibly for time, we should we should uh, have more of the questions be at the end from, from now on. Uh, just uh, given okay. where we are time-wise. Okay, good. Now let me move forward. Let me talk about that um, last piece here. So I probably skipped the metrology piece. Um, so, so far we did, um, you know, Rydberg interactions with alkaline earth atoms, and I want to move a little bit into the many body realm um, with, with our system at Caltech. Um, so we did atom by atom assembly with up to 60 atoms in 1D. Um, and we did a few different, you know, many body experiments even before the COVID shutdown and then continued like after the shutdown and so on. Um, so the simplest experiment that you can do is to start with all atoms in G and just quench it. So you just switch on this Hamiltonian and you observe the dynamics. And it turns out with this Hamiltonian, you can go into different um, kind of dynamical phases in a way. One would be to, you can actually tune this Hamiltonian to something that's close to integrability. And close to integrability, you would uh, observe a typical uh, phenomena that's so-called light cone spreading of interactions, actually kind of similar to this entanglement growth in a way where you see that correlations are built up in the experiment after a certain distance, uh, after a certain time and, and, and distance in a so-called light cone. So you see that only after you say go to 10, only after a certain time you see correlation built up. And you see that experimental results here and simulations match very nicely. You can also do a, a, a quench to a, um, a, a regime where this is basically in a chaotic um, um, phase. A phase is the wrong word, but it's a dynamical regime. And then what you see here is what, you, what I would call quantum thermalization. So you see that you see some oscillation of a local quantity and then it goes to an equilibrium value and that equilibrium value is actually consistent with, with a certain temperature that you get when you trace out the remainder, remainder of the system. It's not 
coupling to the environment, but it's coupling to intrinsic parts of the systems that let you thermalize. And you see again, here note that uh, these blue, black, black dots are experiment and the blue dots, uh, the blue lines are really just um, uh, numerical solutions of this Hamiltonian without you know, doing anything. So I don't include any noise. So this matches extremely well. Okay. So we see generally speaking in a lot of these experiments for a while, we have done more for conformal field theories and whatnot. Um, that we have pretty good agreement between few body observables, I would call these, and, 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 and the experiment. Um, but then you can ask a question, so can you actually measure the many body fidelity? Uh, that's, that's, that's asking something more. Let me, let me explain what I mean with this. So say you have some sort of a theory prediction for what you do in experiment, and you have your actual experiment. So experiment will have errors, so you have a mixed state in experiment, theory will be a pure state. And then what you wanna know, say, is, what is really my, my fidelity overlap? What's my state overlap between experiment and theory? This would be this quantity, it's psi rho psi, okay? That's some sort of my success probability in the experiment to generate a certain target state. Um, can you measure the many for the fidelity in experiment? There's a few different techniques that most uh, standard one would be to just do state tomography. So you basically try to reconstruct that state completely in, in experiment, and then you just look at the overlap here, okay? But what about, um, you know, larger systems where you only have readout in a fixed basis. So in, for state tomography, you can only do it maybe up to 14, 14 qubits um, and you need single site rotation. So it's actually quite complicated. So is there a simpler way to actually go to this many body fidelity? And the answer is yes, you can utilize quantum chaos actually. And that's quite interesting. So coming back to this. Um, so what we do here is, uh, so we, we run an experiment where we start with all atoms in zero and that's just run um, quench dynamic in our case with chaotic evolution. And then we just look at the output probability distribution. So what does it mean? So we just measure in one basis. So we measure in this R and a G and R basis. And then um, in this case, I, I, I say, okay, if I'm in G, I say I have a zero and if I'm R, I have a one. So this would be a mapping onto a qubit system. And then you measure here and you basically get output uh, bit strings in a way, right? So I get all combinations of zero, one, one, zero, whatever, right? So I have two to the n in principle output bit strings that I can have in this experiment, okay? And now I can check um, what's my probability to observe some of these output bit strings. And you will see there's a certain particular pattern that you will see that's sometimes called a speckle pattern, okay? And now the important part is that um, errors perturb this pattern non-trivially. So that means um, if I look at the ideal probability distribution for each bit string and I compare it to one where I have an error, I see a very significant change. Okay, that's, that's, that's just something you can observe in numerics, for example. And this you can use, um, uh, if you look into this a little bit more detail, and then in very, very rough terms, you can see that the fidelity of your experiment is basically the theory experiment output correlation. So you basically just construct different types of correlation functions and which ones you have to use uh, depends on the details between this pattern and this pattern. You just basically look at a correlator. And then if you do it right, um, this correlator basically uh, is, is proportional to your fidelity. Okay, so with this, you can read it out. And there's one very important example that's uh, discussed a lot. That's the so-called linear cross entropy. Linear cross entropy is used uh, by Google, for example, in their supremacy uh, paper. And, um, and then if you look at the paper in middle McCoffell and you read the appendix, you see that this linear cross entropy is supposed to be basically the fidelity. And this you can actually show under certain, um, uh, certain requirements for that. And again, it's basically just a correlator. It's the correlator between uh, the ideal probability for certain bit string and uh, e experimental probability for certain bit string. And then you sum over all bit strings and then you need to think about prefactors and things like that. And um, so in, in their case, because it's a random circuit and it's a very complicated system, it turns out that this is automatically a proportional to the fidelity up to some errors that you can actually analyze, okay. And so typically this type of um, benchmarking where you look at this output probability distribution and look at correlators between experiment and theory is done in digital circuits actually. So this has been done, um, for example, uh, in Google's experiments. And then if you look at IPM papers, they define, for example, quantum volume. And quantum volume is a strange quantity, but like underlying uh, uh, the definition of quantum volume is a similar type of fidelity estimator that actually uses a very similar uh, cross correlation. And that this is called the so-called heavy output distribution test, but they all work more or less the same way. Okay. Um, 
and and to actually normally do that, you need like a, a very randomized um, distribution to actually for this to be right. So we asked a little, some time ago, already more than two or three years ago, I started to ask if you can actually apply this to quantum simulators because my intuition was always that if the if the uh, evolution is is like chaotic enough, um, any error basically that you have should should basically uh, kill the correlation between uh, what you ideally have in an experiment completely. So if you should take this into account uh, correctly, you should basically be able to just like experimentally determine the fidelity of your evolution, even in much simpler situations. Okay, this is um, what we did. So we worked on this for quite a while and then came up with a new fidelity estimator that takes a strange form. It's again a correlator as a prefactor of two that's somewhat mysterious and then you divide by something and again minus one. So it's again uh, a correlation between the ideal distribution and what you have in experiment. And I'll show you some some results for this for this correlator now. So um, so here we measure basically uh, I call it fidelity and I either show fidelity or fidelity estimation on the y-axis as a function of time during one of these quench experiments. Okay, let you let me um, uh, walk you through that graph here. So the first one is that um, dashed line here. So that dashed line is the true fidelity for an up initio model. So I I, I have uh, what I have ideal in experiment and then uh, what I have ideally, and then I make a model of the experiment where I have like basically a noisy density operator that I just like get out of, of uh, 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 open system dynamics uh, uh, numerics basically. So that's the dash line. Then um, this 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 wiggly line is this fidelity estimator applied to the same model. So in this this is really the true fidelity on a, when I model it, and this is the estimated fidelity for that model. And you see it basically just oscillates around the true fidelity. So that means that that beast is a good estimator of the true true fidelity for that model. Now these uh, these gray dots, this is really the experimental results. So this is um, the estimated fidelity in experiment, the many body fidelity, and then you see they all overlap very nicely. So there's a few take home messages. Let me walk you through this step by step. The one is that um, you see that the model we have, however we came up with it, is a very good model of the experiment. So it, like, there's two things that we observed. One is that it matches the fidelity decay correctly on a many body level. It's not just a single atom uh, model that we have. And it also matches the output probability distribution correctly. So you actually see if you take the model and then cross correlate with the experiment directly, you see they also match. So we have an up initial model actually of the experiment. It takes into account all of the noise sources I've shown previously. There's motional decrease in it, laser noise, uh, all kind of decay mechanisms. So it's actually kind of complicated, but we, we basically um, calibrated all of the noise sources separately and we see it matches. So that's actually quite remarkable. And I think it's actually extremely important for moving forward. So we actually know uh, what limits us there. So that's one thing. So this we have, and then also on the model level, we see that for the noise sources that we have in the experiment, that uh, this estimator is correct. So it actually gives you the correct estimation of the fidelity in, on the many body side. So that's, that's also nice. And then, okay, so how good is the fidelity? You can also ask, is this competitive? Yes, it's very competitive. And you see this when you plot the entanglement entropy on top. So it's the entanglement entropy in the target state in that quench. And you see it quickly goes up to up to basically its saturation value. So quickly the whole system, you know, uh, entangles on a many body side. And you see, this is 10 qubits here that at the time scale when everything entangles, when the entanglement entropy, half chain entanglement entropy saturates, we are on a fidelity that's close to one still actually. And then you can go through our numbers, for example, if you want to achieve a same result, say with a, with a circuit, um, you would need uh, a two qubit fidelity of close to three nines actually. So that's that's it's that high actually. So that's that's actually about about that that good. So it's actually pretty pretty uh, uh, highly competitive. Like how 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 coherent the system is. Uh, questions about that before I move forward? David said I told you I shouldn't wait too much. <laughs> uh, so maybe uh, maybe I just move forward and then we have some questions in the end. Yeah, Manuel, we're already like 13 minutes into the community discussion, and so okay, so let me let me really move. wrap up. All right, we have to wrap up. Okay, so this fidelity estimator um, works also for digital circuits. So we tried it numerically, for example, here. So you see that uh, uh, this is a random circuit. So again, it follows the fidelity correctly. And you see that it actually works at much shorter depths. And that's maybe interesting for some in the community than Google's formula, this linear cross entropy correlator. And there's a particular reason for this. I'll show you in, in a second. And it also works with different types of Hamiltonians. So it's relatively generic. So it works for digital and, and uh, digital circuits and Hamiltonians, even at short evolution times. I want to show one more slide um, 
uh, how this is useful in, in a quantum simulation that I find actually pretty important. So one thing is, so we try to simulate this Hamiltonian, but we're not 100% sure actually that we're simulating this. So how do we know all of these parameters? We would do some kind of single, single atom calibration schemes to calibrate all of this separately. But this fidelity estimation can actually be used to estimate this fidelity, uh, these parameters directly from anybody over there. So in particular, you can parameterize your target state are using this, this uh, parameters in the Hamiltonian. So for example, I can simulate my systems with different Rabi frequencies and they get different output probability distributions. And then I can check which one matches my experiment the best. So and this is done here, for example. So we can look at, for example, this fidelity estimator as a function of uh, uh, what I use to predict my experiment. So I see, for example, a very, very sharp peak uh, if I integrate over the whole time evolution at the correct uh, Rabi frequency. I can do this for all parameters, including atomic parameters. So here, for example, is the C6 coefficient of the Hamiltonian that you get out right just with this many body fatality uh, experiment. So this is kind of nice um, because I can basically certify my Hamiltonian I have in the experiment. And that's, some, that's a piece that has always been missing for me to a certain degree in many of these experiments to really have some sort of an independent way once I go to the many body regime that I actually doing still the right thing. That's one. And the other question we have here, which is not um, solved yet, this type of estimation could have a direct um, metrological advantage from entanglement. And that's something we're looking into in the theory part of this slide. OK. Um, this I probably have to be fast. So there's a question. Maybe I can put this into the discussion session. So what do you do you know, when you cannot predict the experiment anymore? So I do this with many, many qubits. And we have some preliminary data for that, not for a lot of qubits, but you can basically use approximate algorithms to predict the experiment. So in particular, you can look at your many body fidelity as a function of the classical resources that you put in. So in particular, x here, x axis is the so-called bond dimension of an algorithm that I use to predict the experiment. And you see, you need a certain amount of classical resources to actually make the prediction converge. And I think it's a very interesting and very important graph because it asks the question, which is, um, how, how accurate do I need to be in modeling of my experiment to do re reliable benchmarking? And it's like, you don't have to be fully accurate because you also have noise in the experiment. And that's also a criticism that always comes with the Google experiment that uh, to reach a certain fidelity, uh, I also could do it with a noisy algorithm. So ours is a little bit different. So I ask, I ask a different question. I ask like, okay, I have a noisy experiment. Um, how noisy can my uh, theory prediction be to actually benchmark it correctly? Okay, and this, this you can actually study systematically, and that's something we're working on these days. Okay, so I'll, I'll skip, you know, I, I'll end this, and then I think I have to skip over this probably. Uh, this is, I think we're at the end of the talk. David, how are we time-wise? Too late already. I guess we're, we're in the discussion section now. All right, but... All right. so let me, let, me, like, let me just say one word so about this uh, two minutes, and then I'll wrap up. Okay. So this story. So you can ask yourself, why does this actually work? So this, you know, you go back here, it works for short times and at short times you're not even, you know, scrambled in the system and this whole output probability distribution shouldn't have this strange form and so on. And it turns out this works because um, uh, there's a new phenomena that we kind of uncovered there, which has to do with the fact that subsystems of a many body system um, scramble very quickly and uh, take on a certain form. And um, don't have enough time about to actually show this in detail, but it turns out that um, subsystems of many body systems, if you take in correlations with a bath, they take on a completely random form actually in chaotic dynamics on a relatively short time scale. And that's something we you know, observed in experiment and I'm just skipping over this, but just the take home message is that um, if you take, a, take into account correlations in the system correctly, a uh, subsystem of a, of a many body systems can be, can look like basically like, like random states that you dial in. And these types of random states here, this is shown here for, for a single qubit, normally to produce these random, random states or ensembles of random states, you would have to construct a pretty complicated circuit. So you would have to construct a random circuit to actually get this. And it turns out you get this automatically in generic chaotic evolution. And that's actually a big, big surprise, actually. I would say this was not clear. So you can take into account correlations and automatically you get out these this high random distributions um, for uh, pretty generic many body systems across the board. So pretty much any Hamiltonian that thermalizes to infinite temperature would give you that. And as this has a lot of different consequences. So we see this experimentally, blah, blah, blah. But in the end, uh, it's, um, it's something that's close to my heart, actually. So you, you can, for example, show because of this that the benchmarking works, 
Uh, but it goes quite a bit farther, actually. It goes, it goes really to the question of how do you formulate um, quantum statistical mechanics? Because normally you look at reduced density operators. What we do here is a bit more complicated. We take into account correlations with a path. And uh, here's an intrinsic path. But it turns out that even if you take into account correlations with a path, there's a universal phenomena left over. And this universal phenomena that you see here is actually uh, more general than quantum thermalization in that sense. So it's not just you thermalize to a mixed density operator, but this mixed density operator, you can think of an averaging of pure states. And this thing has actually a higher, higher predictive power than saying it goes to a thermal state. And that's actually something that came uh, quite as a surprise. And, and uh, so I'm actually presenting this in a historical way. So we first knew the, the benchmarking formula work, but we didn't know why for a long time. And then we kind of like in particular soon won't figure out like really why it worked. And this has to, has to do uh, with this emergent random ensembles, which is something um, that helps us to understand the, the, the benchmarking, but it's I think even much more fundamental and, and much more important actually. Okay, so let me wrap up here. So I wanted to talk about metrology. I'm gonna skip all of this. Um, so this is the, the level schemes that we use. So one is really this G to R encoding, but you can also encode information in long lived ground state. And eventually you wanna use these types of schemes really for quantum computing. So you wanna use uh, Rydberg excitations to mediate entanglement in long lived ground states for, for gates. So that's really where this whole thing is going. So, so far we mostly worked on this G to R transition. Uh, we have some results on, on long lived ground states in, in, in strontium, uh, but this is something we're also working on these days. Okay, so let me wrap up. You know, I, I showed you Slides for atom by atom assembly and Rydberg interactions with alkali atoms. I gave an introduction to cooling and imaging with, with alkaline earth atoms, like first Rydberg results with high fidelity. Uh, and then uh, tweezer clock I skipped. And then I showed um, uh, this most recent results on so many body benchmarking and, and emergent randomness. And I wanna wrap up with this slide coming back to the very kind of beginning. Um, we talked about different directions. And, and the only thing I wanna say is that, okay, these tweezer arrays are relatively young. So we started really on the large scale side maybe in 2016, but it has already shown to be a useful you know, platform for most of these directions of so quantum simulation in particular. There's some interesting result in computing and entangled state generation. Uh, we are on, on like and maybe a few other groups working on metrology. Um, so you can actually, for example, really do competitive atomic clocks in these systems. And we have some proposals for quantum networks. So they are useful, I think, for all of these directions. We'll, we'll see how far you can push it on, on any of them. And, and I think it's really early days, and that's, that's, that's pretty important. So there's like not a lot of engineering that has been done on this platform. So there's a lot uh, you can do still. Okay, and with this, I would like to stop. Sorry for going over time too much. Oh, th uh, thank you so much, Manuel. I'm sure that everyone is clapping with their mute buttons off for a, a really beautiful talk um, and a lot of super exciting results. And uh, we'll have to have you back to talk about the other half of it. Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, oh, no. That is always difficult to keep it basic and then still make it to the so, most recent stuff. Uh, no, we had, it was, it was great. And we had a lot of good discussion during the talk. Um, traditionally, we would be shifting right now to the postdoc and graduate student session. Um, let me ask Dan to make a command decision about whether we have a little bit more community discussion or go straight. So why don't we, why don't we uh, shift that time to 150? So let's take about eight to 10 minutes for the more open discussion. Uh, may, may I ask a quick question, uh, Manuel? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks. So I, I just you. wanted to ask you, you know, from the viewpoint of a computer scientist, you know, um, I, I guess, uh, you know, what, what can I, you know, uh, in what sorts of resources can you, could you provide, you know, me to think about in terms of number of qubits, programmability and uh, fidelity, you know, right now or going forward, you know, what, 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 what does this platform give, uh, you know, what should I be thinking of in, in, in those terms? Yeah, it's a complicated question to answer. So I think like the strength of the platform is that you can, um, go relatively large with relatively high fidelity, but with limited control. So if you look at these most recent results from Harvard, we're also going in this direction. I mean, you can do hundreds of qubits maybe in 2D with pretty high fidelity. And then you might be already out of the realm of what you can classically calculate in terms of like many body physics and these kind of things. So for example, these fidelities I showed for 10 qubits, if you did that thing in, in 2D with the same type of single atom or two qubit fidelity, if you scale it up, um, 
you can reach a fully scrambled system in a Hilbert space, say, if you compare it to the Google experiment, uh, with, with orders of magnitude higher fidelity, actually global fidelity. So, so I think there's, there's, there's only a year or two before someone makes a serious claim about quantum advantage, I would say, with, with Rickberg Adams. That's my, my kind of like, you know, prediction on that side. But it's, it's, it comes with limited control at the, at the moment. That's maybe, maybe the question. So, so to really think of in, in terms of how you typically think, okay, so I make a gate and these kind of things. So um, there we have to go step by step and we have to maybe take a step back. So we, we do a lot of work on the many body realm. But I think we have to take a step back and really try to optimize kind of two qubit and single qubit operations to the degree mm. that you could really talk about, okay, can I do some sort of maybe error correcting codes or things eventually. And that's something we, we look into, for example, like Dan and, and Hartmut and Norman, I, mm. we are kind of planning a new experiment that, that goes more into that direction. And there you, Again, you actually have to take a step back to very basic atomic physics. Like, so, so like mm -hmm. what we discuss every Friday when we meet is like, how do we do optical pumping? So you have to improve preparation fidelity a little bit and this kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. so I, I showed you, for example, two qubit. Uh, we, we can do in this G to R transition, maybe 99 something. In that G to R transition, I think you can go to three nines easily. We'll do that pretty soon. We also know what it's limited by. That's easy. But then to really do a two qubit gate, you have to incur in, in long-lived ground states and then use this G to R transition as a mediator. And that's more difficult. Then you have to take into account preparation fidelity and the hyperfine qubits and all that stuff. And mm. um, and they really have to optimize all of these to get this to three nines in the end. So and and I think um, so you have to do preparation uh, fidelity. That's three nines to start, which somehow no one has done for some reason. It's it's a simple thing. Like okay, you have to optimize optical pumping and then do it right. So that's one step. So really to go through the whole thing. Um, people haven't done completely seriously, I think, with neutral atoms as it has been done with, with superconducting qubits and ions, mm. to be maximally honest. Like, I think, like, Misha's group may be the first ones who really took it a bit more seriously, and there's some good results now, but, like, and like now you have to go back and do it again. Like, you have to do it a few times. There's no good reason to believe that you couldn't do a gate, say, a two-qubit gate with, like, close to three nines there, and it's, like, mm. fundamentally, there's nothing that speaks against it. You just have to do it. This hasn't been done. To, put, to be honest. So, so what has been done mostly is, is, is kind of in a quantum simulation, like we do analog quantum simulation with a specific Hamiltonian. Maybe you could think about Floquet or make it more complicated, but then if you really want to go digital, I think you have to take a step back and really optimize everything right from the scratch. And, and that's that's part of the program that we go through in the center, I think. And, and you have to think about addressing in these things. Um, I think it also comes with the fact that it's a younger platform. So it like, will take a little bit still. So so Manuel, can I ask a follow-up question to that? So yep. there was a lot of work before tweezers. There was a lot of efforts going on for neutral atom computing with atoms trapped in optical lattices. So can you can you compare? I mean, what advantages do the tweezers have? Are the tweezers going to? I mean, there still are a few groups working on uh, atoms trapped in optical lattices, right? I mean, is that very uh, yeah, different, I mean, people, or people is it the same challenges? Um, they're slightly different. I mean, like most people who work in lattices, they work just on quantum simulation. I would say many body physics. I don't know anyone who really seriously works on a, a, a traditional lattice approach for computing. That just doesn't work. I think Mark Safman is. I think Mark Safman is pretty yeah, heavily invested not in that. Really like that. I mean, the techniques are very similar to what I like. Like yeah. maybe Dave Weiss does it. Like he goes back to right. lattice. And that's if it's a lattice or tweezer, doesn't really matter. It's like different from. I see. Okay. Traditional approaches because you don't. The difference is like self-organization versus like restructuring right. in a way that's controlled. So self-organization would mean you make a BC and then load it into a lattice, and then for example, it forms a mod insulator through interactions. Uh, that process I don't think is like particularly suited for quantum computing because you end up with very short lattice spacing because the interactions need to be high and this kind of stuff. So that's like, and you have atom number fluctuations and whatnot, and, and you need to do extremely cold temperatures. So I think people originally thought about this, but very, very mm -hmm. little has been done in, in that direction. And then this approach is a little bit different where you assemble it. And then and I think you just have intrinsically more control and much more reasonable spacings in terms of the optical access and this kind of stuff. Um, so I don't think like with a traditional approach with a BC, you can do serious quantum computing. I wouldn't know how to do that, to be honest. Like people sometimes talk about this. Maybe you can do measurement-based computing with a cluster state or something like this, but I wouldn't know how to do it, to be maximally honest. For many body physics, a different story. If you want to study right. from the Hubbard model, go ahead. Yeah. But you're saying the larger lattice distances really help you a lot then. Also probably with the Rydberg oh, yeah. interaction, yeah, yeah. with the Rydberg gates as well. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, you can control it too, right? So I can control it also, yeah. That's right. I think Dave Weiss's experiment is five microns, and he has this large wavelength optical lattice. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. But the dive Weiss's approach, I would, I would put in the tweezer category in a sense. Okay. That it's, um, right. it's self it's, it's, it's a sample, like, like he just moves atoms around to assemble a structure, correct? Okay. And it doesn't come from making a Bose-Einstein condensate. Like that, okay. that, that are right. fundamentally different experimental routes that like require completely different apparatuses to a certain degree and choices of atoms and things like that. So, um, okay, that's yeah. clear. Yeah, it's really the lattice spacing that's important. Yeah, the lattice spacing and the way yeah. how you assemble it. Then, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Well, I think maybe one one final question before we move to the grad student and postdoc session. And Alp in the chat has asked what the dominant limitation is on gate fidelity. Is black body relevant or is it something else? Black body is not, right. I mean, gate, like the, on, we know what the <laughs> limitation is for the two qubit entanglement. I have shown just the blockade, the simple one between G and R. And it turns out that we were very stupid in our first paper. <laughs> I'll be maximally honest. Actually, the limiting factor there is, is a leftover in the action shift. So we are not as much in the blockade as we thought we were because it turns out the C6 coefficient is actually different. We didn't completely measure it at the time. And uh, we have simulations, we haven't done it. We have simulations, if we just get like half a micrometer closer, we should have three nines actually, in terms of the noise sources. We understand our noise sources very mm -hmm. well now from this many body modeling. And you've just take that model and you put it slightly closer together, you have three nines. And we should probably just do that. So that's that. And, and after that three nines, I don't know completely. So that's it's probably laser noise at that point still. Um, so we're not at the fundamental atomic limits yet in the sense of, um, you know, really spontaneous emission or stuff like this. This, this, this don't, this, like, these are not fundamental yet. And not, not, not dominant yet. So it's stupid stuff like leftover interaction shifts, which is you can get off, get rid of, or uh, typically laser noise, either phase or amplitude noise, depending on which specific regime you are. That's for the ground to root back piece. Then controlling ground states is yet another chapter. Okay, great. Well, on behalf of all the PIs who now are forced to leave, um, thanks again, Manuel, for a really beautiful talk. And we will now all depart and, and leave you to the tender mercies of